Hi, I'm Bill. Welcome to the Retro Sofa in NTSC Regions. Hi, I'm Bill. Welcome to the Retro Sofa in PAL Regions. And, and we're, we're both, both bad, bad at Street, at Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior was a pretty slow fighting game. So slow that when Capcom put out the updated Champion Edition and didn't up the speed, hackers did it for them. There were various hacks out there, Rainbow Edition being the most famous. This is the M4 hack. I remember playing one of these in the corner of a restaurant back in the day and marvelling not just at the fireball nonsense, but at the speed of the game. It was so much faster than what I was used to. The hacks all messed with the specials in different ways, but what they all had in common was speed. Capcom took the popularity of these machines to mean people wanted a faster version of Street Fighter 2, and hyperfighting followed. Street Fighter 2 hyperfighting, or turbo, was such a big part of my childhood that I get a huge hit of nostalgia endorphins just from seeing Ryu's gi in that colour. I remember being so hyped for the release of Street Fighter 2 Turbo that I'd sing the title repeatedly into the bathroom mirror when I went to brush my teeth, because I was 9 years old, and weird. The 16-bit Street Fighter 2 ports were such a huge deal to us in the 90s. The UK didn't have the same arcade culture as the US. We found our arcade machines mostly in cinemas or outnumbered by coin pushes in seaside amusements and holiday parks. Less of a community thing and more of a holiday thing, and anyway not as big. My most formative arcade experiences were Street Fighter 2 in the local cinema and Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles in a holiday park. Yes, I said Hero Turtles. That's a whole other topic. Either way though, unless I was there with friends, I was playing alone. Kids didn't really meet and challenge each other in arcades in the UK in the same way as they did in the US, as I understand it. We played arcade games while waiting for the film to start, or waiting for our parents to finish playing the slowest and lowest stakes form of gambling known to man. Trust the British to take that and make it into a quiz show. Little drop zone one, please, Ben. Drop zone one. Fire it up, please. You're gonna get it, but you're gonna leave it for Leslie. Which sides are gonna go? Oh, it's the right-hand side. Yeah. There were just nowhere near as many arcade machines in Britain as in America. In 1992, arcade revenues were $9 billion in the US and $870 million in the UK. 60% of that revenue was Street Fighter 2, by the way. The game was massively popular in the UK, there just weren't as many places to play it in the arcades, so we had our home computer ports and our console ports. Hey, if you're American and you thought Street Fighter 2 was slow, check this out. Here's World Warrior on the SNES, US version. <laughs> And now, the European version. And side by side. The Street Fighter 2 port on the SNES was already slow and with huge borders, but when it came to PAL regions we had it even slower and with even bigger borders. Some games corrected for this by adjusting the game speed to compensate. This is Super Mario All-Stars, US on the left, Europe on the right. Nintendo basically increased the game speed 20% for PAL to keep it the same speed as the NTSC release. Most games weren't optimised like this, and some games you felt the difference more than others. What's cool with this that I only just noticed is that PAL also gets an extra row of tiles. Still squished though. The difference in colour and quality is the difference between my real SNES through a capture device and emulation. Think of it as an easy way to tell which is which. The NTSC standard was published in America and specified at 60Hz. It was also adopted in Japan and in a number of other countries. Meanwhile in Europe, Australia, India, elsewhere, there was PAL and PAL usually ran at 50 hertz. Some countries in the world use CCAM, but that's also 50 hertz. So when I say PAL, I'm including them too. Just in my mind. So why did we, the humans, slow down games in Europe? Are people in Europe simply slower? I found no evidence of that, but I did learn a lot about electricity, and I know you clicked on a video about Street Fighter 2 because you were eager to learn about mains frequency. So let's size it up for a few minutes, and then we'll get back to the punching. 
just like the last decade of US and British politics. At least we have that in common. Another thing we have in common is AC, or alternating current. AC is how electrical power is delivered to homes and businesses across the world. This is as opposed to direct current, which is possible to store in batteries. But TVs aren't powered by batteries, so we don't care about it. Alternating current changes direction periodically, alternating between positive and negative. It's much more efficient to transport over longer distances than DC, so every country implemented it in their electrical grids. The difference is in how they implemented it. You know how today Google Chrome has a 65% browser market share? And it's even worse because 95% of the market share is browsers based on Google's Chromium rendering engine getfirefox.com. This allows them to unilaterally decide on new web standards in a way that benefits them and their products. For example, if Google wants a new HTML5 feature that's going to make YouTube run faster, they'll just put it in Chromium, and if Mozilla wants Firefox users to have a good experience on YouTube, they'll simply have to implement that standard and that feature in their browser. Oh, it's my mum. Hello. Me and Minerva, we're just hanging out, making a little video. Google's currently working on changing how cookies work, probably because doing so will benefit their ad tracking. Then as now, if you have monopoly on provision of a thing, you get to pretty much decide the standards for that thing and everyone else has to follow. AEG, or if you're fancy, Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft, had a near monopoly on European electricity. They built the first public power plant in Germany in 1885. By 1900, they had 248 and their generators ran at 50 hertz. Oh, fun fact, because you've earned it. The AEG was originally named after Thomas Edison. For five years, it was Deutsche Edison Gesellschaft für Angewandte Elektrizität. Meanwhile, in the USA, Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company was developing AC power stations, and they went for the 60 hertz standard, as recommended by their consultant, Nikola Tesla. Oh, everything electric goes back to these two, and once you're there, it's a sign that you're probably not talking about Street Fighter 2 anymore, and you need to get back on topic. Think of them as a less convivial Ryu and Ken, if you like. It's outside the scope of the video, but you can look at the story yourselves if you want to about Edison and Tesla. You probably already know at least some of it. So why the difference in implementation? We don't really know. Maybe Westinghouse thought 60 hertz would be more efficient and AEG wanted 50 hertz because they wanted a number in the Renard series. Don't worry about it. Exact reasons are lost to time. Basically though, it was a difference of opinion between two big companies who had near monopolies on electrical supply in the 19th century. Hooray! Now to find out how this affected our games, we need to talk a little bit about how CRT TVs work. Cathode ray tubes, if you fancy. Basically, it's a big glass tube with three electron guns in the back for red, green and blue. And they would shoot electrons up the tube at the screen. The electron gun in this diagram is composed of the heater, the cathode and the control grid. The electrons smack into the phosphor on the back of the screen and they light up and you have TV. There's a little more to this, but this is a video about Street Fighter 2. Sets of electromagnetic coils in the tube bend the paths of the electron beams vertically and horizontally to draw the image on the screen. There are about to be some real life video illustrations. If you have a sensitivity to flashing lights, now would be a good time to look away from the screen. Seriously, I'll tell you when it's safe to look back. This is a slow motion video of my CRT TV drawing images on the screen. CRT TVs have a vertical and horizontal refresh rate. Horizontal refresh rate measures how fast the TV draws one line and vertical measures how fast it draws the whole screen. The magnets controlling the vertical refresh rate, at least to start with, were matched to the alternating current they were receiving. If you're as big a Street Fighter 2 fan as I am, you know that there are two reasons for this, depending on which side of the screen you're on. The TV had to be produced at whatever frequency the electricity was, otherwise the lights would look weird. AC lamps, Flicker. If you record European lights with an American video camera, you get a strobing effect, and nobody wants that on their TV screens. The TV signal matched the video cameras, which matched the lights. From the other side of the screen, magnets in early TVs weren't really shielded, so they were subject to interference, including from their own power supply. But if the power supply is 50 Hz, and the display is 50 Hz, that reduces the interference and makes sure it stays in one place on the screen, so it's not as intrusive. If you looked away before, you can look back at the screen now if you like. Japan was all set to adopt the NTSC standard published in the US in 1941. As far as I know, that was always the plan, even before the US occupation following World War II. But there was a problem. Japan hadn't standardised their electricity supply. Japan used 60 Hz in the West, 50 Hz in the East. The NTSC standard specified 60 Hz. Other countries would go on to adopt 50 Hz variants of NTSC, so it was always possible. So Japan was looking at the possibility that they would have to split their TV broadcasts. 
audience. Fortunately, by the time they actually started broadcasting in 1953, technology had moved on to allow TVs powered by 50Hz AC to display 60Hz broadcasts without interference. If you want to know more about that, I'll link Japanese Wikipedia in the description below. Because that's the rabbit hole we've fallen down. We're on Japanese Wikipedia. Effectively though, Japan could follow the NTSC standard at 60Hz without a problem. That's all we really need to know for this video. I mean, I was learned enough. But Japan too, like most other NTSC countries, had their video games at 30 frames per second rather than 25, thanks to Nikola Tesla. Back in Europe, consumer TVs that could display 50Hz or 60Hz signals became more commonplace in the 90s. My TV here is from 1995 and quite happy with PAL or NTSC at 50 or 60Hz. But not all were, and consoles were made for maximum compatibility with whatever TVs people had. The first console to give me a choice to display 60Hz, though it still defaulted to 50, was the Sega Dreamcast in 1999. I think the first time I learned about these international standards was putting on Sonic Adventure and switching between the 50 and 60Hz modes. Back in the SNES days, we had no idea. We didn't even know it was slower. We were just happy to get our Street Fighter 2. And how happy were we? Guinness gave Street Fighter 2 the world record for best-selling video game by a third-party developer. With sales of 6.3 million, Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior is the best... Alright, come on then. You'll be purring in the voiceover, so that's not going to make any sense because I'm not going to see you. With sales of 6.3 million, Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior is the best-selling SNES video game by a third-party developer. It is, however, only fifth in the list of all-time best-sellers for the 16-bit console since it is beaten by Super Mario World, Super Mario All-Stars, Donkey Kong Country and Super Mario Kart, all of which are produced by Nintendo themselves or, in the case of Donkey Kong Country, by a second-party developer that was, at the time, part-owned by Nintendo. I think there's no such thing as second-party developer and the name of the record isn't quite right. The Donkey Kong Country games were first party because Nintendo published them, but Rare was a third party developer. Fight me in the comments if you want. It's a video about a fighting game. Anyway, Street Fighter 2 was the Super Nintendo's best selling third party game, and fifth overall. It's all the more remarkable that Street Fighter 2 did so well, because it was famously and controversially more expensive than other SNES games at the time. This issue of Bad Influence magazine contains this little catalogue advert from Special Reserve, a short-lived mail order service for video games in the UK. Look at their list of SNES games here, and they're all under £48 except for Street Fighter 2, which costs a whopping £62.99. Also, why does this Master System have a picture of Chun-Li next to it? Heh, <laughs> look, CRT TVs. Scart is awesome. But maybe we'll save that for a future video. I feel kind of bad that we pulled up Bad Influence magazine of all things and only used it to show this advert. This magazine only had two issues, despite it being based on a much beloved cult TV show. It was definitely aimed at kids, being presented by Andy Crane, Violet Berlin, and some humanoid cartoon dinosaurs. But Bad Influence was great. Link in the description. Anyway, because I feel bad for the magazine staff, we're going to flick through to their Street Fighter 2 review. Ah, look, they've got it at £64 for the Super Nintendo, £25.99 for Amiga. I played the Amiga version as well back in the day. The SNES port wasn't just great for the arcade accuracy, but because the controller had six buttons. Ever played Street Fighter 2 with one button? I wouldn't recommend it. Not even at half price. I think for half price I'd play it with half the buttons. So the Sega Mega Drive with the three button pad. Anyway, they gave it 96%, presumably the SNES version rather than the Amiga. I'll link the magazine in the description. Never in the history of consoles has a game been as fun as this. Never. Hmm. Sure. And when you consider that level of hyperbole, which was everywhere, and the imports market gouging upwards of £100 out of British buyers who couldn't wait to get the game, £64 didn't actually seem that bad at the time. I mean, it was high, but... It was cheaper than we'd been paying. Japan had Street Fighter 2 in June 1992, and Europe didn't get it until December. That was a good few months for importers. It held its price too. In autumn 1993, it was still £60 in the Argos catalogue. And by Christmas 1993, it was replaced in the Argos catalogue by Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Still £60, but now it was faster. Turbo never topped the World Warrior in sales, but it did reach 9th place in the all-time SNES sales numbers, which is remarkable, considering it was basically just an update. Magazine reviews at the time scored Turbo highly, but also said they weren't sure if it was worth dropping another £60 if you already had the original version of the game. As an example, here's Nintendo Magazine System. Oh <laughs> look, it's the seal of quality again. Anyway, let's skip to the end of the review and check out these comments from Rad. 
Everyone's been working themselves into a bit of a state about the release of Street Fighter Turbo, and whilst I can see the attraction, I can't help but be a little disappointed by the final result. The supposed turbo speed is nippier than the original Super NES car, which isn't hard, but still lacks the pace of coin-op. That's not to say Turbo is crap, because it's actually brilliant. The problem is that there just isn't enough in the cart to justify spending another £60, or about a million pounds an import, if you've already got the not dissimilar Street Fighter Ordinary Edition cart. Of course it's not the pace of the coin-op, Rad. Arcade machines were closed systems with their own displays, and they ran at 60Hz. Isn't it wild how we simply didn't know how slow our games were back in the 90s? For fun, let's compare the PAL release of Street Fighter 2 Turbo with the NTSC release of the World Warrior. There's your ordinary edition, Rad. What we had until then was the slow edition. Turbo basically let Europeans play the game at its original speed. Or slightly faster, if you wanted. I think it was up to 30%. Okay, while we're here, let's compare the US and European versions of Super Street Fighter 2 on the SNES. <laughs> I mean, that's the same, isn't it? Did Capcom finally optimise a Street Fighter game for PAL regions? Amazing! Well, I know what you're all thinking. Let's see what that's done to the leaderboard. They even kept the speed option. So this was the first chance Europeans had to play Street Fighter 2 at the turbo speeds. The SNES actually had quite a few PAL optimised games. In fact, I think almost all first-party games were already optimised. Mini Baracks on Reddit started putting together a list that I referred to, and I'll link that in the description below. Street Fighter 2 is on it, of course. The Donkey Kong Country games are optimised, since Rare was working out of the UK. But this is the first time Capcom did it. Did they do it again? Let's see. Yep, Street Fighter Alpha 2 looks like it's PAL optimised. So how does that change our ranking? Ah, there we go. I'm not the first person to make that list, but I probably am the first European. The lists I found online always put Turbo at the top. It's third. These two, these two play at the right speed. These two don't. Easy. People who think Turbo is at the top of this list, imagine if it was 20% slower. Would you still keep it there? If you're in an Edison region rather than a Tesla region, Super Street Fighter 2 takes the top spot. And, as the only other optimised one, Alpha 2 takes second place. I know it's got a three second pause before each fight, but outside of those three seconds... This is a really good port of a really fun game. And running at the right speed anywhere in the world is just the icing on the cake. It's the second impossible port I've talked about on this channel, and again, Modern Vintage Gamer has a great video about that. I'll link it in the description. Also, these are the two games that have England in them. I want to take a look at those two stages because I'm from there. England. Okay, that's a Union flag and the announcer says England. Is that the Scottish Highlands? I mean, the, the Northern Lights, sure, the UK gets those all over the place, but you're most likely to see them in Scotland as well. Is there a dragon? Is that a Welsh dragon? Where are you from, Cammy? That's a posh southern English accent you're putting on there. Talk like that in your Scottish castle where you live with your Welsh dragon. No wonder you fly the Union flag. Link in description to a cool video by Babe Ruthless if you want to learn more about Cammy's stage. Surely then Birdie's stage in Alpha 2 will be more representative of England. Oh no, it's a toilet. I mean, fair enough nowadays, but not in 1996. Why do the rubbish bins say trash, Capcom? British people don't know that word. We're also not putting those outside lights in our toilets. They're just not good lights for toilets. Is that Sherlock on the wall? Fine. Oh, this is egregious, though. Look at those plugs connected to that light. 
This would have been a perfect opportunity to show off the best plug socket in the world, but you just went ahead and put US sockets in there, didn't you, Capcom? The guy standing around in the middle is fine. That guy's in every English toilet. He's very busy. That's why he only shows up in round two. Isn't it cool, though, that the two games with England stages are optimised to play in England? Sorry, India, Spain and Russia. Of course, all of our games would have been optimised had it not been for Tesla's decision to go against the prevailing European standard at the time. If the USA and Japan had been on 50Hz AC2, games developed there would be programmed to run at 50Hz. Don't worry, Americans. I see you watching this saying that'd be worse because you'd have fewer frames per second. But we didn't know. We were playing games 20% slower in Europe and we were fine. Anyway, if all games all over the world were the correct game speed, but at 25 frames per second rather than 30, do you think you'd know or care? Do you even now? Being used to 30 frames per second, see an obvious difference with this footage from Street Fighter Alpha 2, an optimised PAL game. We'd still develop screens to support higher frame rates eventually, just like we have now, and in the meantime, everyone in the world would have the same gaming experience. A plus that 20% reduction in frames gives you a 20% higher vertical resolution, and wouldn't that have been nice? We don't know why Tesla went for 60 hertz. Maybe he and Westinghouse edged higher because everyone agreed that 50 to 60 hertz was a good range for long distance transmission, and they wanted to make the lights a little bit less flickery. But in Europe, we're fine with our 50 hertz electric lights. In fact, having lived in Europe all my life, I reckon that if Tesla had decided in about 1900 to go with 50 hertz, the only people affected by that decision would be gamers. That's it. I've been on Japanese Wikipedia, so I'm an expert now, and I disagree with Nikola Tesla, the designer of AC Electricity, about the implementation of AC Electricity. He should have stuck with 50 hertz, and then my copy of Street Fighter 2 wouldn't play like the characters were fighting in an English river. Thanks for joining me on the Retro Sofa.